So I'm going to ask you to read with me uh, from the Word of God. And we're going to go to the Epistle of Peter. Peter chapter 4. <coughs> the first verse. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. But he no longer to live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. That's the way of the Gentiles, says Peter. Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. That's the exhortation of this morning. Using hospitality one to another, without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. That God in all things might be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his this behalf. Now, verse 17. For the time has come, that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let him that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. <coughs> if judgment must begin at the house of God, and it has begun, said Peter, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Third point is obedience to the gospel. We were Gentiles. Excesses, lasciviousness, idolatry, evil speaking. But now we are the children of the Lord. And as the children of the Lord, in this general epistle, Peter writes to us. And we take the word of God as being profitable. We take the word of God as being a message of exhortation and of admonition that we, children of the Lord, might be built up in our most holy faith. And Peter, if he were preaching from this pulpit this morning, would ask the question, if the righteous scarcely be saved, Peter, are you not stating things that are too hard to comprehend? Are you suggesting that the Lord Jesus cannot save us? Of course he isn't. There was a man personally involved with the Lord Jesus. He walked with him, he talked with him. He beheld the miracles that he did. And yet somehow Peter, as an apostle of the Lord Jesus, claims clearly that the righteous shall scarcely be saved. God can't save us. It would appear as if God can't save us. Not because he isn't able to save us, not because he isn't willing to save us, but
but because we apparently don't want to be saved. Who is there in this meeting this morning that doesn't want to be saved? Not a hand raised. Of course we want to be saved, we say. Then why don't we let God save us? How will God save us? The only way He'll save us is if we obey the gospel. Right or wrong? The only way we can be saved is to obey the gospel. And here, Peter is suggesting that all the righteous will scarcely be saved. As I pondered this over and over again, I had to ask why. What is it that Peter saw in the whole question of judgment? Because you remember, he had been involved. He was the one when they took the Lord Jesus like a lamb to the slaughter, who when confronted by that little girl, warming his hands by the fire, she said to him, but aren't you one of his followers? And he turned and he blasphemed, he swore a little, warming his hands by the fire, he says, I don't know him. And you remember how Ellicott crew, three times he denied his master. Judgment was real in the heart of Peter. And so you and I have never been in the place where Peter was. We're head and shoulders as the big fisherman. He could look across the expanse of faces of people such as we see today, clamoring after the Lord Jesus. And there the Lord Jesus walking behind Peter as it were. Peter pushing people aside, sitting down there giving place to his master and beholding all that the Lord did. Surely the signs and the wonders and the miracles of Jesus Christ but it must have worked deeply into the heart of Peter. And when his master was taken to die upon the cross, and all seemed lost, and when indeed Peter with the other apostles went back to their fishing, coming back they made their way to the shore as they heard the voice of the master now risen from the dead calling them to come and dine. And when the Lord Jesus took Peter and he called him, Simon, by Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? I believe there is a man who understands very clearly what judgment is. He felt open. He felt exposed. Not ridiculed, but exposed before the Lord Jesus. And my brother and sister, today I want to ask you, you're one of the throng. Brother Eckley is one of the throng. But if I had to stand before the Lord Jesus in front of you all today, and the Lord Jesus asked me pertinent questions, I would feel exposed. Judgment is an exposing thing. Judgment is a responsible thing. Judgment is a thing that you and I, each one, are going to have to face up to. There isn't a man or woman in this meeting who won't have to stand alone before the Lord Jesus. I have a clear understanding of that by the grace of God. I find that that coming judgment burns a deep, deep burden within my heart. It's a fire. It's a kind of a responsibility that sits upon me, that makes me say the things I say and do the things I do. It's somehow a, a steering point. It's a mechanism that leads me on, because one day I'm going to stand before my master. If I have no concern about that judgment, then I'm not going to do the things that I'm doing. I will find no reason to. It's because I have to stand before the Lord on that day. And every one of us present are going to do that. You're going to have to give an account of the things that you have done. And if the righteous scarcely be saved. Scarcely saved, Lord. Lord, let me ask myself the question today before you. How do I know I'm saved? What is there in my life that merits my salvation? Is it that I'm one of the congregation? Is it that I have people backing me? Is it I have, that I have people patting me on the back, wanting to hear me minister? None of those things are proof enough of my salvation. What really counts in my personal experience is that I have the Lord Jesus indwelling my heart. Amen. 